everybody. I'm Navis from the Demo Group ASD. Um, I'm going to speak to you today a little bit about uh, my life and things that I've been doing in ASD and uh, some thoughts about the future. Um, I hope to keep it short, but I would be mostly interested if you ask some questions at the end. And you can ask me questions about um, ASD, our demos, it could be a technical question, it could be anything, anything you want to ask. I'm not going to go into technical details about uh, uh, demos that I've made so far because I don't think it's very relevant or, or interesting to many people, but you're really free to ask me anything you want. So, next slide. I keep thinking that um, ASD, just like all demo groups, they seem to follow uh, a trend which after doing this thing for many years, we, we've built uh, ASD around 92, 93. I can now think that we can make a connection between uh, demo groups like ASD and music bands. So think, think of a music band, how, how they start. Uh, they start at the beginning being very original, doing something original with a lot of mistakes. That was our uh, uh, initial era where we uh, started to discover ourselves, discover what we can do. We used to go to many demo parties to, to present demos that were not very good or very interesting or they didn't have anything special. Then you get into a more uh, a thematic period where you identify what's good about what you're doing and how you can uh, be better than the rest or how you can make something that really expresses what you, what you want to express. Now, the years pass and then you get into the collaboration mode, which means that eventually we will start collaborating with other people to make demos because we are maybe running out of, out of time. We have more uh, things to do in life, so it gets more difficult. And then eventually we will become like the old uh, uh, music groups where they only call them to say stories about the past or do some uh, um, as a, a nostalgic piece. Having said that, I, I will tell you a story which was very, uh, when I realized what was happening, it was very, very interesting to me. I was what, once in a, in a plane traveling, it was a long flight, and I, saw, I said, okay, let's watch a film. And that film was uh, the new Mad Max. And I had no idea what this film was about. I started, I was expecting something quite boring, like an American uh, superhero film or something and then I was captivated it was captivating I, I enjoyed it so much and at the end I thought I didn't have internet with me to check I thought wow the original Mad Maxes were good but now these young guys have taken over some I don't know 30 year old new director and he's made this masterpiece it's with new technology this is amazing and I was so wrong because it's the same guy that did the first Mad Max, I think it's called George Miller, he's quite old now and he's using all the technology. So if you think about it, maybe even in old dinosaurs like us, there is still some life. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, we get a really good feeling when we make demos and that's why we, we still do them, even though we may not be able to produce them as many as we did in 2004 or five, but it's still good. And uh, I need to say a few things about the people that work with me, like uh, music. I think I have been very, very lucky to come across this guy, because like me, and that, that goes with the other guys in the team, the uh, Mivikos and, and, and CH3, they really want to push the idea until it's uh, the best one we can get. And for me, that's the, the best type of, of management. They, they don't do this because of the money, because I'm going to give them some money at the end, because I'm not but they do it because they, they, they appreciate what we do. And I've, I remember spending many, many days in my, in my house thinking, many nights, thinking, I'm making this demo, no, nobody but me and maybe a music has seen it, and maybe in August, in three months time, there will be another 10,000, 50,000 people that will have seen and enjoy, and maybe one day they will come to a party and tell me, oh, really, I, I enjoyed this demo from assembly or this demo from, from whatever. And I think that's the only thing that, that really keeps, keeps us going uh, these days. It's 
getting to a point where actually discovering new ideas with collaboration or what I'm going to uh, tell you next is actually, um, it's, it's the, right, the right time in, in our lives, I think. I think that it's, uh, we know that it's impossible to, we don't have the resources like a big uh, game studio or even a small game studio to, to start making demos by putting together animations from professional artists. We, we just can't do that. Even the, uh, our artist in ASD, CH3, who is, is currently um, doing work for big um, uh, Hollywood films, I cannot tell him, look, can you make me an animation of uh, a rhinoceros running? He will do it, but it's, it's so much time and so much effort. I cannot tell him, make me the whole demo like this. So we have to cheat. And you know, everybody does this. And this, this is why demos are different to making games or making uh, offline films. And um, I have been thinking, trying to uh, put together some list for you, maybe. Uh, even, even now, what I think is our uh, cheating, let's say, sheet. Um, anything that uses L-System fractals is, is actually a very, very good idea to use because you can, you can produce complexity from very little uh, seed uh, code. So, I, I don't know, you maybe some of you remember a demo called, uh, that we did called Metamorphos, which, by the way, it's my favorite demo of the, the, the ones that we did. And it was really based on very simple, um, very complex looking things, but they were very simple to describe in code. Um, so animations need to be uh, kept simple. Chinese shadows, I think it might be the wrong uh, expression for that, but uh, for me, Chinese shadow is where you put objects that supposedly are very close to your camera, so there's no light going on to them. So you just see the shadow, which means that you don't have to do any texturing. I, I actually hate texturing because I can never get it right. Um, because it's, you need to have the artist to do that, and, and we, we simply don't have the artist all the time. Uh, yeah, combine that with splines, uh, geometry modifiers. There was yesterday some VJ tool that I was watching uh, before our uh, VJ show, which I thought it was really nice, where it was some sort of traveling inside geometry, that it was constantly moving and changing. I was thinking, well, this is a really nice idea. They, can, they start with some very simple uh, organic looking models, and then they put some patterns in and they change. But the, the, the patterns themselves, not just this old uh, pearly noise, it could be, for example, parallel noise where you quantize the uh, displacement, so it looks more like a mechanical movement, which is a lot more interesting than just a wobbly uh, animation of parallel noise. <clears throat> so that, that is what I would call procedural geometry. And the, the other thing that I've, I've been playing quite a lot with uh, cameras, uh, depth cameras, I will tell you uh, more later. And uh, I've discovered that actually using motion flow can... Uh, be, when, when you have animations uh, that you record, of course, with a camera, it is down to 20 frames a second or 25 or something. That's not good enough. You need to add some, some spice to it, some action. So using motion flow that you can calculate with OpenCV or something, you can add all of that and uh, add particles, add, add animation, then it makes it a lot more interesting. Um, I spoke... I, I told you before uh, about this uh, VJ tool that I saw. Um, I actually presented the VJ tool last night. Uh, they, it was plagued uh, because of many other technical problems that we had. But it was quite interesting because when I thought I'm going to make a VJ tool just for fun, just to see how it is, and maybe we present it here as a wild demo, let's say. Um, I thought that it's, it's probably impossible because I don't have the time to make uh, 20 different uh, effects and then put them together. So. I thought, what if I make two? One is the, uh, an ambient movement, which is uh, um, animation of particles. They move in, out, you control it with a MIDI control. And then you have some hard visuals, which uh, come from uh, a video. Let's say uh, you have a 10-minute video of some old, um, I don't know if you remember the Mind's Eye videos from the early 90s. So they look very, uh, yeah, early 90s procedural graphics. Uh, and combine the two things, but not just overlay, but use the pixels from one layer, let's say, to displace or posterize or quantize or whatever, the other one. And, and that seems that it can produce uh, an endless team of, gra of graphics that are repetitive only really after hours. So I was very happy with that. 
uh, hopefully I will be able to, to play uh, that again somewhere and put it on Poet as a Wild demo. Uh, I will tell you something about, I have this job with these guys, uh, with Mandis 3D, and uh, I will tell you what I do with them because I think it's quite interesting and it will t t get me to my next point. Um, so this is a, a 3D camera, it's mainly a hardware company, uh, but we are trying to solve, a, let's say, a software or algorithmic problem together. It's really interesting. So imagine if you have a depth camera like uh, the Kinect, so it's structured light, uh, the first Kinect, not the time of light. Uh, and you have plenty of these uh, cameras around, let's say 15, in, a, in an empty space. And imagine that you are able to get inside that space and then from all this information you get a full 3D reconstruction of yourself to either save it and view it later or to stream it to somebody else or even view it yourself with, uh, uh, let's say, the Vive. Now that's fantastic because what it means is that I could potentially one day make a demo that uses this data without me needing to do that much coding, which is great because I don't have time to do much coding. But the problem, of course, is that that data is, is, is huge. It's, we are talking about gigabytes for, uh, let's say, one minute of animation and um, probably quite a lot more. So I was thinking it would be very nice if I were to make a demo that's based on that to think of a way to um, reduce the complexity quite a lot, maybe make them into, into splines, and then it will be, I will be able to compress it a lot more. And I, it will not be realistic anymore, but then the, the demo will not be very realistic itself. It will be a kind of met metadata that look like the human form, but it will be all 3D. And um, I think that's more interesting than reality. Reality, you oh, turn on the TV and you can watch it, but abstraction is <laughs> it's better. I have been, uh, I gave a, a presentation at assembly last year and one of the questions I remember was uh, would you consider going to VR? And I said no, never. And I ch really changed my mind. Uh, I was a uh, fool. Uh, it was not the right uh, answer because uh, I wasn't exposed as much as I should have been to VR. So now I am and I can tell you yes, the answer is yes. It's, it really is exciting. And th there are a few points that, for me, if I were to do a demo in VR, it would mean that I would find, again, another layer of love about demo scene. Because if you've, if you've done, like we've done maybe combined, maybe over three hours of demo content, and we've done everything, your tunnels, we've done your particles, your uh, star fields, anything you can imagine, the, you know, the old story demos, eight minute demos, one minute demo, boring demo, interesting, everything. But what about the VR demo? Now you have one problem. How the hell are the rest of the people going to watch it? I don't know, but I know that I can make a demo that is a, a, an experience for one, and then if, if the rest want to experience in a demo party, then they can see a pre-recorded um, pre version of somebody's head looking at things, that would be me, having done this at home. Whether this will be an interesting as a demo, as a 2D demo, I, I simply don't know, and I don't think anybody knows, but I'm willing to try that out. Um, I think that I know what will make it interesting. Uh, I know what it, will, uh, what it would take to um, stop you from feeling sick. Obviously, don't move the camera too much. Uh, let things happen around you in maybe a, a two by two meter space. Um, use the controllers, there are these amazing trackers, they know exactly where you are, you can measure distances, you can use it to program, to move things around, lift them and then they are uh, there when you play the demo back. And I think that the time is now, I, I, I think that the time for doing this is the next 12 months. I think that if, if we or I delay it for another two years, let's say, then something else will, will come and it will be gone. Or some other scene, let's say, will take over and say, okay, this is what we did. And it actually looks like a demo scene demo, but it's outside the demo scene. And uh, we will feel like, oh, why didn't we do that? We could have done this. We have all the expertise. We, know, we have all the people. And, and if we do it and we do it right, then people will actually talk about us in the same way that they did when uh, Plastic did uh, Linger in Shadows, if you remember. And that was a long time ago, yeah? It was... Uh, 2008 or 9, and, and these guys got a lot of exposure, and the, and the demo scene, I think. 
Hey? They do, okay. I, I, I don't know much about what is out there for VR, but I, I know uh, a lot, but not everything. Uh, well, that should go to 90 degrees, but never mind. <laughs> I actually did it on purpose. It looks better. It looks better. Okay, so I forgot to say that uh, I'm very happy, I'm really, Really pleased that Zden invited me to uh, to be here with you. I'm, I'm really, really happy that, that I did so. And uh, because Sator is one of the groups that I really admire, and uh, uh, many people outside the demo scene they cannot understand what is what is this that that uh, the Sator demos have that uh, make them interesting. But I I think I do, and I think that most of you also do. And it only comes through um, <coughs> having watched hundreds of thousands of demos in the past and knowing how hard it is to do procedural noise that is under control. So you, you, you can have an effect with, uh, with uh, some sort of positive feedback that blows up and all you get is just white or uh, uh, just geometry um, uh, completely destroyed. But these guys can do it so that it never gets to that. It always feels so controlled and I really appreciate it. So for me, when we said, oh, let's make a demo as well. It was uh, like, a, it, it really was like a, a dream come true. And <laughs> I told you earlier that when you, when you reach the collaboration stage in, in your life, it means that you are on the uh, downward sp spiral, but maybe it is, I don't know. But then again, I told you the story of Mad Max, so there is always hope. So, uh, of course, Satori says, well, we do the demo, it's, it's all software, and I, I do uh, the demos in, in OpenGL, and uh, of course, we are both programmers, how are we gonna do this? So I said, okay, I will do some vignettes in OpenGL, and you do the, the post-processing, and uh, let's see what happens. And to be honest, I haven't seen the very uh, last uh, version of it. Uh, we got Chaser to do the music, we, we changed a couple of uh, music styles. So for, for the work that we put in, uh, I, think it's, I think it's a good demo. And one more thing about this. I'm developing, so the, I'm, I'm developing this, uh, let's say, VR, simple VR platform where I'm trying to port all of my stuff for generating content from the, the 2D demo platform, which, by the way, I, I need to tell you, the, the project of my demos, all of the project since uh, OpenGL's 2001, they, it's called Lesson 02, because Nehe was Lesson 02, and everyone is a copy-paste from that single Nehe project, that shitty Nehe project that everybody said in 2002, said this is shit, don't use it. Uh, but it's still there, so that gives you an insight of how, uh, let's say, <laughs> not very organized I am with this thing. But I, I enjoy that because I've discussed with Zden quite a lot about these things and I, th I think that we share this, uh, let's do it and it doesn't matter if, it, if we don't have the I don't know, UML diagram or we don't check in the code uh, properly, it's, uh, it's anarchy for the sake of anarchy in a way, I, I really enjoy, that's part of making demos that I enjoy because when I work I cannot really do that because I would get fired, so it's good. <laughs> Yeah, well, other things. The VR is, is good, so this is something to explore and we've, we've covered this. Um, it would be nice to do something with a procedural geometry that is based on skeleton tracking. So all of my work these days is either Kinect depth cameras or uh, VR, uh, those sorts of things. So, so having content coming in from uh, my skeletal movement is, is really good. I, I simply cannot see any other way to, to create big demos with, uh, with a lot of content. Stop motion, that's another thing. I've had, I had started a demo a few years ago to go, take to a Spanish party, but I haven't finished it, where uh, you make a shader where everything looks like it's, it's stop motion and it needs to be as, as photorealistic as possible. It works really well. If you have one scene when things come, come out and they, uh, let's say your, your static scene is, let's say, an open book, okay, and each page it turns and it's another effect and it's another effect. You think, 
that looks like a stop motion. Usually, in, only in very expensive stop motion, you will see a lot of the, the camera doing a big movement around things in a room and out and so on. Usually, the camera is static and then the action happens in front of you. Low frame rate, good uh, color blending, ambient occlusion, shadows, all of these things. Uh, I still, I will never stop doing things or trying to get better at doing the texture synthesis uh, um, that we use in demos such as Metamorphosis. And I, it would be really nice if maybe in the future uh, we do this demo in VR and then Satori makes a demo in VR and maybe uses the same pipeline that we are using. And I'm really open to, to share it with, uh, with Dan. It would be, just think about it, that an ambient demo, uh, I don't know if it's the, the right way to call them these uh, kind of noisy demos, let's say ambient, that is in VR. Would it work? Would it not work? I think one needs to t try it because I don't think anyone in the world right now has tried it. Uh, we, you would be trapped in noise. Uh, it's, it's an interesting idea. Next one. That's it. So that covers pretty much uh, everything I had to say to you. Every, anything uh, that you want to ask, I'm, I really look forward to answering your questions. Yes. Basically about uh, VR. Yes. Because you are saying that making a demo that works in VR would be awesome, but I... that means a lot of work. For local demo, you can focus on a frame and just show what you wanted to show. Yeah. But in VR, you have to... Have 360. Yeah. Somebody might never even look at. So yeah. Could you rephrase the question and so I repeat it? Yeah. The, 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 the question is this. In, in a demo, you have, let's say, a 45 field of view into a world. And you choose that, and this is your world. And behind it, it's just empty space. Because obviously, uh, as, as you're moving inside your virtual world, things have to just disappear to save space and speed. But in VR, you have uh, 360 degrees, you can look anywhere. And if one chooses to look at uh, black, empty space, then it's not, it's not a good experience. I guess the, the answer to this is, uh, first of all, you could, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of, of actually making um, a procedural system that will generate something that is, let's say, borderline interesting around without having to do any work. So imagine, let's say, if your scene is, let's say, this space, and, and you, are, you are sitting, you are standing there, and this space just generates from the floor, and you want to look at what's behind. Let's say that behind is a sea of cubes, let's, let's say. Okay, so you turn around and you see a sea of cubes. It's not very interesting. It's in your own, uh, um, let's say, interest to... T yeah, yeah. So, so I think part part of part of the experience is to to work out where the action is happening. And let's say that if this thing comes on as a wave, so imagine that it doesn't come all at once, but it comes as a wave. So first these objects there, and then this in the middle, and there's this in the middle. And while this thing comes on, then this thing there goes down. So that gives you the impression of a wave. So you turn around, so to see what's happening. You don't want to look at this because it's gone. Yeah, you cannot force him un unless, you know, I'm there pushing him. Giving the clues to the people. Yeah, yeah. I, the, actually, the answer is I don't know. <laughs> that, that, that's... It's really a complex problem. Uh, yeah. It will take uh, a lot of time to fill all the empty space. Yeah, and yeah. You can focus that to make viewer not look into the empty space. <laughs> yes, yes. But... For me, um, looking, in, looking things in VR that I've made myself is, as, as an experience, is as exciting as when I first worked out that in OpenGL I had true color, or when I first saw the palette of Commodore 64. It's one of these moments that you think, wow, it's so exciting. Look, it, look it's there. Yeah, it's, it's a new challenge. It may completely fail, but I, I, ha I have to do it. Do you 
see any future in uh, augmented reality, not the, not the virtual reality, but augmented reality in demos. I know it's uh, a little bit off because the augmented reality is sort of interactive, right, from the perspective of the person who um, drives it, but uh, and the demos are non-interactive. Do you see like a place in the demo scene for augmented reality experiments? Um, obviously, I cannot, I cannot answer this question by saying no, because I've said it once before. Um, I, I'm not yet com um, convinced of the technology, so what I have seen, the HoloLens, is great when it works, but when it doesn't work, it's not so great, and it's not very powerful. But I know that it will become fantastic, like you would be wearing it, and the price. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think the, the answer is uh, not yet, but it, it would need to be quite minimal. What I, um, in demos, what I try to do is that, uh, maybe it's a, a cinematography thing, but I try to establish a plane where the camera either rotates like that or it, or it moves like that or up, upside down. It's as simple as that. All demos have this movement. It's a very basic thing. So if you're wearing this thing in augmented reality and you can establish yourself a plane to just grow things, Fantastic, but if if you can't, if you are, if you have planes, then it becomes also practically more difficult to add something to it. Uh, also, uh, what I really love about the Vive compared to the the Hololens experience, let's say Vive, you know, anything like Vive, is that you put it on and you are in darkness. There's nothing. It's you, you're detached. Well, with the Hololens, you are not. You still see your room. Okay, if you don't have any other questions. Okay, thank you very much.